Today we review the Loverly Canon C100 Mark II. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Tomorrow's Filmmakers. My name is Justice McCraney, and today we are going to be doing a review of the Canon C100 Mark II. And now I know what some of you are thinking. Uh, isn't this camera like five or six years old? Is it still good? Is it still worth it? Is it still something I should buy? And yes, I'm gonna be answering all of those questions and giving my personal opinion on this camera at the end of this video. But first, let's talk about the C100. Now the amazing people at Lens Pro To Go actually sent me this camera to review. So if you're ever looking to rent any sort of film equipment, whether it's for a couple weeks, few days, whatever it is, definitely check out Lens Pro To Go. They have great service. And also you can use the coupon code TOMORROWS10 for 10% off your purchase all year round. Now for those of you who don't know, the Canon C100 is the cheapest camera on Canon's cinema line. I mean, we know that they have tons of DSLRs that we use for video, but they actually have a designated cinema line, which is for specific video cameras. I mean, this is not a picture camera or a photographer's camera that just has a recording option or the video is kind of an add-on. No, this is a specific video camera that is meant to perform like a video camera. The video isn't an afterthought. The video isn't an add-on. The video isn't something they just added on later. This camera performs like a video camera, and that's the reason I love this camera. Because as a video shooter, there are so many features that I want when filming that DSLRs just can't give you. And I mean, sure, some DSLRs, the newer ones, are starting to come out with more features that have better video options, but let's face it, they're never going to be perfect unless they become a video camera. For example, if I was going out to shoot something with my DSLR, I definitely need to bring my field recorder because the DSLR doesn't have any XLR inputs and usually the input microphone is not very good. I'd also probably need to bring an EVF for the screen because it's really bright. And if I was going to shoot handheld, I would definitely need to bring some sort of shoulder rig because of how small it is. And then you start getting into all this extra gear that you have to bring along to get your DSLR to function like a video camera because it's not a video camera, it's a picture camera. Now, what do I need to bring along with me for my C100 to work? Nothing. Not a thing. It is a video camera and it performs like a video camera. And it's the type of camera that I can pick it up, turn it on and go shoot and I need nothing else. So let's talk about some of the features that this camera has to offer and some of the things I like and some of the things I don't like. First thing you'll notice is that this camera is much more solid than a normal DSLR. It is heavier, but it's not too heavy that you can't hold it for a long time. It comes with this really solid side handle that's very comfortable to hold and a recording button on the side handle. And a top handle, which I so, so love. When using a DSLR, a lot of time I had to purchase a cage and then purchase a top handle, but no, this one comes with one. Speaking of the top handle, we have two XLR inputs that are fantastic along with phantom power and some really great controls for the audio. This is another great feature about the C100. Audio inputs are not terrible. If you're doing an interview or just run and gun shooting, you can run the mic directly into the camera. This means less gear that you have to bring on set and you can just pick up this camera and go. You don't have to bring a whole lot of stuff along. It also comes with a shotgun microphone holder, so if you're doing any sort of documentary style filmmaking, your audio can still sound great because you have a shotgun microphone. Also, one feature that they've added to the Mark II that wasn't on the Mark I is an onboard microphone. On the Mark I, the only way to get scratch audio was to have the top handle connected. And that's perfectly fine unless you wanted to really trim it down so you could fit it on some sort of stabilizer like a glide cam or a Ronin then you wouldn't be able to have that audio on there that you could sync up later. But now they have added a built-in microphone, which is a lifesaver. It's not horrible, it's not amazing, but it gives you that scratch audio no matter how you've configured your rig. Along with the XLR inputs, it also has a microphone jack on the side just in case you are using a different microphone that doesn't take XLR inputs. We have a beautiful OLED LED screen on the back, 
which is a big improvement from the previous one. The old screen wasn't terrible, but this one is definitely better. And the screen rotates in all directions, giving us much better mobility and flexibility when shooting. The worst thing ever is to have to look at your LCD screen at an angle because it won't rotate and you can't see it. We also have a joystick on the screen, which helps with ton with navigating the menus. And right above the LED screen, we have the viewfinder on the back. Now the viewfinder isn't the greatest, but it's definitely usable. I found that the viewfinder on the Mark II has sort of this kind of blue wash to it that looks a little bit different than the OLED LED screen. So if you just want to use it to get focus or it's a really bright day, absolutely the viewfinder is usable, but if you're trying to get color perfectly, I would stick with the LED screen because the viewfinder isn't really good with that. If you would actually like to get an EVF for the viewfinder, you can get a Zucuto EVF that fits right on the back of the camera and works really well. But now looking at the outside of the camera, you can see that there are a ton of buttons. Tons of buttons. And compared to my DSLR, yes, there are tons of buttons on this camera. Everything that you need is on a button on the side of the camera. We have magnification, peaking, zebra, autofocus lock, shutter speed, white balance, ISO, everything that you need is right there on the side of the camera. But what is more impressive is that all of these buttons are assignable. If I wanted button number nine to be shutter speed, I could make it that in the menu. Or if I felt more comfortable for button number 14 to be white balance, I could change it. So whatever you feel comfortable with and however you want the buttons to pan out, you can change it on the camera. And thank you so much, Canon. ND filters. I love you forever. Thank you. The C100 Mark I and Mark II has built-in ND filters that make getting exposure so much easier. And if those of you who don't know what an ND filter is, it's essentially sunglasses on the front of your camera. So if you're shooting in really bright conditions outside and you want to keep your aperture all the way open, well, the only thing you can do is really crank up your shutter speed. And this will bring down the exposure, but it'll also give it that really jittery Saving Private Ryan look that you might not want. So instead of doing that, we can bring an ND filter, put it on the front of our lens, and it brings the exposure completely down for the entire image. That way we can keep our shutter speed down and also keep our aperture wide open. Now the C100 has that built into the camera right in front of the sensor. So there's no need to stick ND filters on the front of the lens as you can now do that just by scrolling the wheel. We have two stops, four stops, and six stops of ND filters. Now, the battery on this thing packs a huge punch. It will last you probably around five hours. And that's a lot more than my DSLR batteries have ever used. So if you get two of these big batteries, I don't ever think you'll have to worry about battery life again. You will always be able to shoot with battery life. And also I love the fact that you can check the battery life on the actual battery by just clicking the button. Right above the battery we have dual SD card slots, which is a really great feature. So you can have two SD cards in there and just tell the camera to start recording on the other one whenever one gets full. Or you can actually record both at the exact same time so that you have backups. Now, I prefer to just shoot one and then you know switch it over to the other, but if I was filming something incredibly important that you're paying me so much money to do, then yeah, maybe I might record to both of them, but most of the time I just record to one than the other. You've also got your playback buttons right on the back of the camera, along with your headphone jack, remote jack, USB and HDMI ports, and the battery charger. Now, you can take the battery out of the camera and charge it like any other battery. But what a really great feature is with this camera is you can simply plug the camera into an outlet. It's a great feature to have because if you're filming something that's really, really long and you're not moving a lot, maybe like a seminar or a concert or maybe even a, a sermon, you can easily just plug the camera into an outlet and then you'll have battery life forever. It'll never, ever die. I've actually seen a lot of churches end up getting Canon C100s, Canon C300s because you can just plug them in and they'll go forever. Now the Mark II here also comes with a new autofocus feature. Now I hate autofocus. I hate it with a passion because it never works. It always gets out of focus and always ruins my shots. But this is actually really impressive. With the dual pixel autofocus that is built into the C100, it's actually very easy to get focus with autofocus on. So if you turn the autofocus on to continuous, you just have to place this box in the middle over whatever you want in focus and it immediately jumps to it. Now this would have saved me so much heartache 
in so many shots if I would have just had this option. Especially with a moving subject at like wide open, it actually still keeps them in focus. Now it does have its drawbacks, like the object has to be directly in the middle of the screen, so you can't move that box. And if you're really trying to keep the rule of thirds, it's kind of difficult because your subject has to be directly in the middle of the screen. Now you can get around that by using the autofocus lock. So it basically locks the focus in place where you tell it to. So you can get the object in focus by placing it in the middle of the screen, lock the focus, and then get the composition that you're wanting. Now it is annoying that the autofocus lock is kind of on the side of the camera, but since all of these buttons are assignable, you can actually assign the autofocus lock button to the magnification button on the side of the handle. So now it's right there at your fingertips. You can get something in focus, lock it, move away, lock onto something else, and it's much easier. Now in the end, I would still only use autofocus in special occasions, like if I had a steady cam or it was a really difficult shot because manual is the best way to focus, but it's a great feature to have just in case. Now when we look inside the menus, we can see that we have everything that we've been wanting in a DSLR without having to get Magic Lantern. We have peaking, we have zebras, we also have markers, which is really helpful when getting the right framing. If you're planning on cropping it or adding letterbox to your film or anything like that, it'll give you guidelines on your LCD screen. We can also shoot in an AVCHD format or an MP4 format, whichever you decide. Now the Mark II does have slow motion built into it. It's only 60 frames per second and that is something that is kind of annoying if it's a cinema camera, if it's a video camera, you know, I kind of want more than just 60 frames per second. But if you're used to 60 frames per second with DSLRs, then it's not that big of a deal, but I just wish it would go more than 60 frames per second. Now the low light in this camera is actually great. It's really, really good. Now it's no Sony a7S and you know, there's still noise in the image, but it's totally usable. Here's a night shot that I got with the Canon C100. Again, totally usable. Now compare that shot with a shot of my Panasonic GH4, which shoots 4K, and the C100 looks 10 times better because the Panasonic GH4 does not do good in low light at all. It does not. So this camera actually works really well in low light. Yes, there's still noise. Yes, there's still grain, but a little bit of denoising, and it's actually really usable. And now we are going to get into the controversy about this camera. And I say controversy, because if anybody is thinking about getting a C100, they usually hesitate because of this reason, and they usually don't because of this reason. And it is a con for the C100. And that is the fact that it only shoots in 1080p. And I mean, this is a big deal because we live in the era of 4K. Phones are coming out with 4K. Every single camera, every single new DSLR has some sort of 4K option. Everything shoots 4K. So why in an era of 4K would I buy a camera that only shoots 1080p? And that's where a lot of people actually get confused with the C100 because the C100 actually does shoot in 4K, but it automatically downgrades it and downscales it into a 1080p image. So inside the Canon C100, there is a 4K sensor and it shoots the image in 4K, but it puts it on the SD card in a 1080p image. Because if you think about it, if the Canon C100 shoots in 1080p and a Canon DSLR shoots in 1080p, uh, why would I buy a Canon C100? Just for the features? I mean, does a Canon C100 look exactly the same as a Canon T5i? If they do, I mean, that's really lame. Come on, Canon, what are you doing? But that isn't the case. The Canon C100 does look a lot better than a Canon T5i, even though they both produce 1080p images. So if we put a T5i image and a C100 image together, they both shot at 1080p, but you can clearly see that the Canon C100 has a much better looking image. And that's because it's downscaling from a 4K image. If we put a Canon C100 image and a GH4 image side by side, they actually look very good and very similar because they both shot at 4K. And if you compare that image to the T5i, you can really see a difference. The T5i is much softer and definitely looks worse than the Canon C100. So it's very true. The Canon C100 does not produce a 4K image, but it also doesn't have the same Im image quality as a Canon DSLR. It's a 4K image, but it's downscaled to 1080p. So without further ado, here are some test shots with the Canon C100 Mark II. So 
as you guys can see, the Canon C100 is a great camera. It's a great video camera. Now, I know what you're thinking. Is this camera right for me? Is it something that I would use? Or do I need 4K? Is the fact that it doesn't shoot 4K gonna be a huge problem for me? And that all really depends on what you're shooting. Most people say, I must have 4K. But do you really? Does your client want 4K? Have they ever asked you for 4K? I mean, I have a 4K camera, I have a GH4, and I have had clients ask if I shot in 4K, but the video I always give them is still on a 1080p timeline. Because most companies and businesses that I've worked with don't really know what to do with a 4K video file. Even if you shoot it in 4K, they usually just want it in a 1080p HD image. So if that is the case, I take my 4K image, I downscale it 1080p and give it to them, well, the C100 already does that for me. So no, it doesn't output a 4K file, but it takes a beautiful 4K image and gives it to you wrapped in a 1080p present. So in the end, what kind of shooter are you? Are you the kind that goes on corporate shoots and you have hours to set up and, and all the time in the world and everything that you need, here's the lighting, here's the boom pole, here's the recorder, here's all this kind of stuff. If you have plenty of time to do that and you need 4K, then this isn't the camera for you and you should probably get something else the GH5 or all these other cameras that are coming out? Or are you the type of shooter that needs stuff done quickly? Maybe you record long seminars, maybe you're a documentary filmmaker, maybe you just need a video camera that has all the features right there for you and you can pick it up and go. If that is the case, then this camera is perfect for you. And yes, it does shoot in 4K, but it doesn't output in 4K. Now, would I buy a C100 in today's market? Yes, I definitely would. Would I have bought a C100 right when it came out or even you know four years ago? No, I would not have. Personally, I think that it was a little bit overpriced. When it first came out, the Canon C100 was about $8,000. I think that's a little bit too much. You can get a lot of cameras now for less than $8,000. But now these cameras are going on eBay for like 1600 bucks. That's nothing. So if you are looking to upgrade your DSLR to a fully functioning video camera that is a beast and won't let you down, the Canon C100 is definitely a camera for you. So for me personally, DSLRs are fantastic. They really are. They give great image qualities. The Panasonic GH4, 4K, beautiful image. It really is, and I love them. But yes, they can get frustrating because they are not meant to be a video camera. So the Canon C100, fixes a lot of those problems that I had by making it an actual video camera. So again, it all depends on what type of shooter you are. It depends on if you want to upgrade from DSLRs to more of a video camera or just continue down the line of DSLRs. It's entirely up to you. But I hope this video has really helped you guys out, showing you kind of the pros and cons and all the features that the Canon C100 offers. So again, if you're still not sure, you can rent the camera for like four days. Lens Pro to Go has it. You can use the coupon code TOMORROWS10 for 10% off your purchase. Definitely check it out and I will see you guys in the next episode.